Hey everybody, and welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today, I will be watching Napoleon Defeated, Aspern, 1809. This is the next video in Epic History TV's Napoleonic Wars series. Last time, we saw Napoleon's troubles with Spain, and this episode's called Napoleon Defeated, so, you know, seems like things are not going super well for Napoleon. Anyway, I'm excited to see what happens. Uh, guys, please check out the Patreon. I've got exclusive content on there. And let's jump right into this reaction. An Epic History TV History March collaboration. Supported by our sponsor, Osprey Publishing. In 1809, France, under Napoleon Bonaparte, was the most powerful nation in Europe. Mm. But the French Emperor's invasion of Spain and Portugal the previous year had failed to deliver the easy victory he'd expected. And with many of Napoleon's best troops and commanders now tied down in Spain, an old enemy prepared to challenge France once more. Yeah, and, and Spain would remain an issue for a while, and part of the issue was that, um, I mean, Napoleon, if he was there, he could fix bad situations, but when you've got enemies cropping up across the continent, Napoleon can't be everywhere at once, and he has, you know, talented men under his command, but, uh, you know, things really start going bad once Napoleon leaves, so, you know, he's gonna have to leave Spain to deal with other situations, and the fighting and, the, you know, the bad situation is gonna continue on the Iberian Peninsula. So, you know, it's kind of a situation where Napoleon's trying to do everything at once, but he just can't. He's only one man. Hmm. Austria had been preparing for war with France since her last humiliating defeat at Austerlitz in 1805. Yeah. Big victory for Napoleon. Now, with Napoleon busy in Spain and a British promise of cash subsidies, Plus a supporting attack in Northern Europe, it looked like the ideal time to strike. This time, Austria's armies would be led by Archduke Charles, Emperor Francis's younger brother. At 37, he was two years younger than Napoleon, but already had 15 years' experience of high command. Wow. And he was learning from past defeats. He'd begun to reform the Austrian army along French lines, copying Napoleon's core system, and introducing new infantry tactics. Nice. I mean, hey, there you go. I mean, on one hand, that is the mark of... Uh, in the case of Napoleon, it, it shows that he was clearly a great and innovative leader because people start to imitate his methods. That shows you that he's really doing something right. But at the same time, once people, your opponents, start imitating your methods, you perhaps are going to start to lose some of the advantage you once had. I mean, that's the thing about having these great innovations and in strategy, you know, particularly at first, you're going to be massively ahead of everybody else. But once everybody else starts to catch up a little bit, you know, if they're uh, intelligent, like the, the Austrians are, it's very intelligent for them to try and copy what Napoleon's doing, you may start to lose some of that advantage. In the Napoleonic Wars, infantry fought in close order, packed together, standing shoulder to shoulder. But why present such an easy target for the enemy? First, command and control. Before radios, orders had to be... Yeah, we already watched uh, a video on the uh, Napoleonic tactics and learned about how maneuverable uh, these formations were, and it really allowed... Napoleon to uh, take advantage of situations very quickly because he could, you know, get his men moving into position a lot more quickly than his opponents could. Be relayed by shouted commands, drums or bugles. Difficult enough in the smoke and din of battle. Almost impossible if troops were scattered. Mm. Second, firepower. Smoothbore muskets were inaccurate beyond about 80 yards, so volley fire, firing en masse, was the best way to inflict physical and psychological damage on the enemy. Third, morale. Soldiers were much more willing to advance into danger or hold the line if they did so together as a unit, urging each other on. Fourth, 
defence against cavalry. Scattered infantry were easy targets for horsemen. Only by sticking together could they fight them off. The basic tactical unit of infantry was the battalion. A French line battalion had, in theory, 840 men, but in practice, nearer five to 600. Mm. Our example here has 605 men, a typical strength for a battalion on campaign. The men were divided into six companies, four fusilier companies and two flank companies. On the right, the grenadiers, made up of the tallest, strongest men, often detached to form elite all-grenadier units. And on the left, the voltigeurs, specialist light infantry used for skirmishing in front of the battalion. Skirmishers moved independently, used cover and fired at will to harass and unsettle the enemy, while preventing enemy skirmishers carrying out the same task. Yep. Most armies also had specialist light infantry units for this. I mean, this is exactly what we saw in that infantry tactics video. I think, actually, this is directly ripped from that. So, you know, it's nothing we haven't seen before, but a good refresher, I guess. This role, such as the British 95th Rifles, French Chasseurs à Pied, and Austrian and Prussian Jäger battalions. The traditional battlefield formation was the line. All companies formed up alongside each other, three ranks deep. Line formation maximized the number of men who could fire their muskets at the enemy, and limited casualties from artillery fire. But it was extremely vulnerable to cavalry if it could be outflanked. And even for well-drilled troops, it was difficult to keep the line straight while advancing across broken ground. Mm -hmm. So, for manoeuvre and attack, battalions usually formed a column of divisions. This was a more flexible formation that allowed the battalion to advance quickly, though it presented a larger target to enemy guns, firing solid round shot that would tear through several ranks, and far fewer men could fire their muskets at the enemy. Theoretically, therefore, the battalion would deploy into line before reaching the enemy. But carrying out this slow manoeuvre under fire wasn't always possible or sensible. So some commanders kept their men in column, relying on momentum to break the enemy line. This was a risky tactic that often worked against raw troops, but led to high casualties when facing better trained infantry. Yeah, and I mean, with this, you got to remember that, you know, Napoleon's army uh, is very well trained and, at this point, very well experienced. I mean, they've been doing a lot of fighting across Europe. Plus, uh, generally a pretty high morale. I mean, France really feels like it's got something to fight for. So, you know, well-trained, experienced troops with high morale... That's exactly what you want for this sort of uh, this sort of formation, um, and I mean the the training expertise of the troops was really a, a massive benefit uh, in Napoleon's uh, column. Like British redcoats, a column could be closed up quickly to provide protection from cavalry, or if there was time, could form a square. With bayonets fixed. The battalion formed an all-round defense that often resembled more of a rectangle. Famous square. Enemy cavalry could surround the battalion, but not break in, as horses won't charge a solid wall of men and steel. Mm -hmm. But an infantry square was extremely vulnerable to artillery fire, and could only move very slowly. Changing quickly and smoothly from one formation to another, especially under fire, required training, practice, and experience. In 1809, the Austrian army began to use the battalion mass formation. Crude, but more suited to hastily trained conscripts. Mm. This was a dense column with limited firepower. Yeah, and, I mean, their troops will be more hastily trained and be less cohesive, because you've got to remember that while, I mean, modern nation-states are you know, in very early stages of formation here. Even France is still pretty diverse with a lot of different dialects uh, across the country. But, you know, 
their forces are pretty cohesive. Most, the vast majority, are French. They're tied with a common language, culture, and plus, you know, the revolution, its aftermath, the patriotic upsurge, that is really bringing the French people together. Think about the Austrian forces. It is a disparate collection of different peoples. I mean, you've got Czechs, you've got Austrians, you've got Hungarians, you've got Bohemians, etc., etc. You've got a massive group of different ethnicities that, in this time period, are now starting to come into modern nationalism. It's still very early, but they're starting to come into that. So, this is not nearly a as much of a cohesive force as the French forces for many reasons, but one of those reasons is the very diverse ethnicities of the group. They don't have that common bond. In fact, many of them don't even have the common bond of a shared language. So you're, you know, you're going to have a harder time bringing all those people together. And huge vulnerability to enemy cannon. But it could quickly close up to repel cavalry using the same principle as the square but without the complex drill, and was much more manoeuvrable. Mm. Napoleon, warned by his spies that Austria was preparing for war, left Spain and raced back to Paris. Back to the battle. On the 24th of January, 1809. The French army in Germany, commanded by Marshal Berthier, would need urgent reinforcement. So Napoleon summoned units from Spain, called up young conscripts and soldiers from his German allies in the Confederation of the Rhine. Okay, well, this is what I was just talking about. I was saying one of Napoleon's big advantages was how uh, unified and experienced his army was. But as you can see, and I don't know if this will play into what Epic History TV calls Napoleon's defeat. I assume we're going to see him defeated. But the forces he's bringing together now are a diverse bunch, not all French, we've got Germans in there, plus there's some raw conscripts. So this is not as experienced, trained, and unified uh, an army as Napoleon is used to. Um, I don't know if that is going to play into what happens here, but just, just something notable. La Grande Armée was no longer the finely honed instrument of mm. 1805, but with Napoleon at its head, it was still a formidable force. Okay. Archduke Charles ordered diversionary attacks in Poland and northern Italy, but launched his main attack against France's ally, Bavaria, on the 10th of April. It came a week earlier than Napoleon had expected and mm. caught the French Emperor by surprise. Wow. Charles was relying on a rapid advance, but a last-minute change of plans, torrential rain, and a slow-moving baggage train slowed progress to a crawl. Marshal Berthier was a brilliant chief of staff to Napoleon, but an indecisive field commander. Mm. His forces were too widely dispersed, and Marshal Davout's third corps was dangerously isolated at Regensburg. Uh -oh. Charles ordered his corps to converge and destroy it. But on the 17th of April, Napoleon arrived at Donauwert to take over command. He immediately ordered Davout to withdraw from his exposed position. It was too late for him to escape without a fight. Davout's third corps was one of the best in the Grand Armée. Oh yeah, we've, fast we've seen. fast battle across wooded hills, the heroes of Auerstadt threw back the Austrians. Despite the heroism of General Major Liechtenstein, badly wounded, leading his troops forward. Third corps escaped the encirclement. Hey, there's Davu and his men working their magic again. Very impressive bunch. <laughs> the Battle of Teugenhausen was the start of Napoleon's so-called four-day campaign. Mm. First, he used Marshal Lefebvre's Bavarian 7th Corps and a provisional corps under Marshal Lann to drive a wedge into the Austrian army. Then he pursued its left wing towards Landshut believing he was following the main Austrian army. Uh-oh. French troops and their German allies stormed the town's bridge to win a hard-fought victory. But Napoleon realized that Archduke Charles was not at Landshut, and that, once again, 
he'd left Marshal Davout to face the main enemy force. Sending Marshal Bessières in pursuit of the Austrian left wing, Napoleon swung north, falling on the Austrian 4th Corps at Ecmou. Mm. The French and their German allies won their fourth victory in as many days. Wow. I mean, this seems like it's going pretty well so far for Napoleon. But Charles's main force was still intact, and hoping to keep it so, he ordered a rapid retreat across the Danube. The French pursued, storming the walled city of Regensburg, which they knew as Ratisbon, with its vital stone bridge. Napoleon put Marshal Lannes in charge of the assault. Mm. When the attack faltered, Lannes threatened to lead the next charge in person, and his men, suitably chastised, <laughs> took the city. Nice. During the siege, Napoleon was hit in the foot by a spent bullet, causing widespread alarm. But it proved to be a superficial wound. Jeez, that's uh, that's a close call. I mean, imagine if Napoleon had been fatally or seriously wounded in that uh, situation. No Napoleon. Let's be honest, it pretty much all crumbles. I mean, there's a lot of talented men, a lot of uh, talented marshals, but without Napoleon, I mean, you you've got nothing. You're totally screwed. So imagine how different. Uh, the next couple of years could have been if Napoleon was uh, killed or critically wounded right here. It's kind of crazy. Stubborn Austrian resistance had allowed Archduke Charles and his army to escape across the Danube. Napoleon had cut the Austrian army in half, but both sections now retreated in good order towards Vienna. Retreating back to Austrian territory. Forces in pursuit, detaching Lefebvre's Bavarian corps to deal with a popular revolt in Tyrol, and 3rd Corps and the Württemberg 8th Corps to guard his line of communications. Mm. Charles chose not to defend the capital, which surrendered on the 13th of May after a short bombardment. Instead, Charles and the Austrian army lay in wait across the Danube. Mm. Napoleon was now down to 80,000 men, facing 110,000 Austrians. Outnumbered. Charles's army had fought bravely and well throughout the campaign. But Napoleon still had a low opinion of Austrian troops and decided to attack. Okay, I mean, you, maybe maybe a little bit of ego there. But to be fair, we have just seen Napoleon score several victories over the Austrian army. So you can see how perhaps, uh, you know, he may not, still may not think too highly of them, despite the fact that They've been trained up and are fighting a lot better. Uh, I guess we're going to see how this is going to go. <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, yeah. On the night of the 20th of May, French engineers hastily built a series of floating bridges between the river islands of the Danube. Mm. And French troops began to cross. You know, you love to see the importance of engineering to uh, the military, building bridges. I mean, it always makes me think of the Roman army, who is, you know, obviously famed for their engineering abilities. You know, it's a really underrated element of military practice, but very important. Um... By noon the next day, Napoleon had most of Massena's 4th Corps and his cavalry across the river. About 24,000 men and 40 guns, holding the villages of Aspern and Essling. Mm. Napoleon expected the Austrians to retreat once more, and that he'd only face a rear guard. But reports soon arrived that the entire Austrian army was advancing against him in five attack columns, 90,000 men and 300 cannon. Okay. The situation got even worse. The Austrians began to float heavy barges and obstacles downriver smart. to smash through the flimsy French bridge. Very smart. Each time, Napoleon's only supply route was cut off for several hours, mm. causing critical delays to the arrival of reinforcements and ammunition. See, usually Napoleon is the one forcing his enemies into bad positions, but... 
and we've yet to see what happens. But right now, seems like Napoleon is in a very tricky position uh, that he put himself in. Uh, and the Austrians are taking advantage of that. So I guess we'll see how successful they are. The battle began around 2.45 p.m. as infantry of the Austrian first column attacked Aspern. Mm. The village was soon under attack from three sides. General Molitor's French garrison clung on desperately, fighting hand-to-hand -hand in the streets and suffering 50% casualties. Jesus, brutal. To support the defenders of Aspern, Napoleon ordered cavalry to charge the Austrian third column. But they could not break through the Austrian infantry, closed up in their battalion mass formation. Yeah, I mean, you can see it right there. They're, they're using these new formations, and they're using them against Napoleon. They've learned, clearly. At 6 p.m., Archduke Charles ordered General Bellegarde's second column to take Aspern at any cost. Mm. Charles himself rode among the front ranks, urging the men forward. Nice. In ferocious fighting, the Austrians took the village. Napoleon immediately sent in newly arrived reinforcements to recapture it. About the same time, the Austrian fourth column began its attack on the village of Essling, where Marshal Lann had taken charge of defenses while he waited for his own corps to cross the Danube. The first Austrian assault was repulsed. The veteran French cavalry commander, General Despagne, led his cuirassiers in pursuit, but was hit by grape shot oh. and died of his wounds. Around 9 p.m., the Austrian 5th Column finally arrived in position mm. and made its first attack against Essling, which was thrown back by Land's troops. As night fell, firing died out across the battlefield, and men got what rest they could among the dead and the wounded. Yeah, Jesus. Can you imagine? I mean, can you imagine being there at all? But imagine being there at nighttime. You know, you've just fought all day. The noise of cannons is slowly dissipating, and now you have to try and get some sleep, surrounded by dead comrades and dead enemies, while you anxiously wait for the next attack. I mean, that's gotta be, <laughs> that's gotta be a very rough night's sleep. Uh, a very, very anxiety-inducing situation, I would imagine. Day two. Overnight, Second Corps and the Imperial Guard crossed the Danube to reinforce Napoleon's army. All right, there you go. Which now numbered 71,000 and 150 guns. So Napoleon's still outnumbered, but after managing to hold on uh, in day one, struggling but managing, he is getting more reinforcements across the river, so it seems like the situation is getting better for him. But then the bridge broke again, oh. leaving Davout's third corps still waiting to cross. Uh oh. Nevertheless, Napoleon decided to attack, using second corps to break the Austrian center. You always want Davout first, with you. Aspern would have to be retaken. Heavy fighting broke out in the village before dawn. By 7 a.m., it was back in French hands. At Essling, fresh Austrian attacks were fought off by General Lasalle's cavalry and units of the Young Guard. With both flanks secure, Napoleon launched his main attack in the center with Land's Second Corps. Austrian guns poured fire into the advancing French ranks. Mm. General Saint-Hilaire, leading the attack, a hero of Austerlitz and Jena, had his foot blown off. Wow. A wound that proved fatal. Rough. Archduke Charles sent his grenadier reserve forward to strengthen the line. The French infantry, under torrential fire, began to fall back. Wow. At this critical moment, the French bridge over the Danube was broken again. <laughs> halting the vital flow of reinforcements and ammunition to Napoleon's army. Oh man, that's unfortunate. 
By 2 p.m., the French had been driven out of Aspern once more. Heavy fighting continued in Essling, which was briefly captured by the Austrians, then retaken by the Young Guard. I mean, you got to be impressed with the uh, Austrian army and their improved training. Um, plus, with Archduke Charles, I mean, clearly they made an improvement, and uh, they're putting up a pretty even matchup against Napoleon and the French army. You know, it's very back and forth at the moment. Um, yeah, they're putting up a good fight. Napoleon knew his army could do no more. At 4 p.m., he ordered his exhausted cavalry to make a last charge to keep the enemy at bay, mm. then gave the order to retreat. Archduke Charles, whose own army had suffered huge losses and was low on ammunition, was content to watch the French withdraw to the island of Lobau. Okay. In the final moments of the battle, Marshal Lannes, one of Napoleon's finest commanders and closest friends, was hit by a cannonball that smashed both his legs. Oh no. He died of his wounds a week later. It's a big loss. It was a deep blow to the Emperor. Hmm. Yeah, that's got to be rough. I mean, that's rough both tactically, you know, you're losing uh, one of your brilliant men, and, and personally. I mean, what a loss for France and for me. Emotionally, that's got to be a blow, uh, especially because, I don't know if Napoleon felt this, but you, I imagine you'd probably feel at least a little bit responsible. I mean, you're in charge, um, and, you know, this is pr one of the worst battles you've had. You are retreating. Um, I think they're fortunate that the Austrian army didn't pursue them. Um, you know, perhaps Charles should have had a little more initiative, or, you know, maybe his army was just too tired and, and brutalized by the battle that had just happened. But yeah, this is a, this is a pretty unfortunate uh, ending to this battle for Napoleon. The two-day Battle of aspern essling was Napoleon's first major defeat caused by his overconfidence and hasty yeah. planning. Yeah. Both sides suffered heavy losses, and Napoleon avoided a much greater disaster only because Jeez. of the exhaustion of the Austrian army. The French Emperor had learned new respect for the Austrians. Under Archduke Charles, they had fought bravely, with greater confidence, organization, and leadership. Within days of his defeat, Napoleon had summoned reinforcements to join him on the Danube and begun planning his revenge. If you'd like to learn more about... All right, well, you know, check out the original video and their sponsor. This is a big moment in the Napoleonic Wars. Like they said, this is uh, a, you know, substantial loss. This is the first time we're really seeing something like this. Uh, and it's also pretty amazing because... A lot of it is down to Napoleon himself. A lot of the blame can be placed on Napoleon's overconfidence and his underestimation of the Austrian forces. So yeah, definitely, uh, definitely a tough situation. You know, I guess we'll we'll see what happens next. Will Napoleon get his revenge? How will it go? Um, I mean, we've still got a <laughs> a couple more years of uh, warfare to go on. So you know, we know he's not out for the count yet. So yeah. Uh, I definitely enjoyed watching this video. I hope you guys did as well. Uh, if you did, please leave a like, subscribe, and check out the Patreon. Um, you know, make sure to tune in to the rest of the series. I hope you guys are having a good day, and I will see you all again next time.